we'll wrap up the last part of your capacitance chapter today. All right. So there's one part I haven't gone through with you. That one is regarding the discharge of a capacitor. So discharge of a capacitor is actually a new addition to your syllabus from 2022 onwards. Okay. So there are a few sets of equations that you will need to learn for discharging a capacitor. Now, when you're talking about discharging a capacitor, let's just uh, go back a bit on how you charge a capacitor. When you were talking about your capacitor, this one here being your capacitor, and you wanted to charge it, you would need to connect it to a power supply. So what I mentioned to you then is that you would have an amount of charge that is being pushed from one end of your cell or power supply to one plate of your capacitor, isn't it? And then after that, at the same time, the same amount of charge will be repelled off the other plate of your capacitor. So at the end of the day, what happens is that your capacitor will have something called separation or charge. When one plate becomes negative, one plane becomes positive, okay? So your capacitor will become fully charged when the PD across your capacitor is equal to the PD across your voltage supply. So say if this one is 12 volts for your voltage supply, your capacitor becomes fully charged when it is 12 volts equal to your voltage supply, okay? So this is the case where you're trying to charge out your capacitor. Now, if you take your fully charged capacitor and then you were to connect it to a resistor of resistance R here, what will happen is that that charge that you've originally stored will, that you've originally stored on the capacitor will start to discharge. So originally what you had was that you had a certain amount of charge here all right, let's just say that this one was uh, negative Q, negative Q, negative Q, negative Q, and then this one here is negative Q. So when you're talking about the plate of capacitor, the right plate here will store a charge of negative Q, the left plate will store a charge of positive Q. Once you connect it to a resistor in the diagram below, that charge that you have stored on one plate of the capacitor in your case, the right plate here, it will actually start to move towards the other plate. So the way you move towards the other plate is that you go through the circuit that is connected through. So in the process of it going through the circuit that is connected through, it will actually cause a charge to flow through your resistor here, causing current, causing power dissipation. And then after that, eventually that charge will flow back all the way to this other plate discharging that plate itself, okay? So now, this is what you call as discharging a capacitor, all right? When your fully charged capacitor is connected to a resistor, it will actually start to discharge. It will actually have some amount of current, some amount of charge that flows from one plate of your capacitor to the other plate of your capacitor. So here, your charge here can be thought of as consisting of electrons. They flow, flow from the negative plate to the positive plates until there are equal numbers on each plate. Basically, you're discharging the plates, okay? So at the start of your discharge, whatever current that is released from your capacitor, it is initially very large, okay? But it's in the opposite direction to when it was originally charging because you can see from here, when you are charging out your capacitor, your direction of current flow is in this direction. This is the direction of your current flow. This is the direction of flow of your charge, specifically your electrons now, okay? But when you start to discharge it, you are also gonna have a current flow, but this time it's in the opposite direction. It's going like this. You see, it's opposite. So this is again the direction of flow of your charge, which we assume to be electrons here, okay? So you would have some sort of current flowing from your capacitor through your resistor, and at the start of your discharge, that value is actually quite large, all right? But it will tend to decrease with time, okay? So it will gradually fall to zero, okay? Now, when your current starts to drop to zero here, the way that it drops is that it tends to decrease exponentially so that if you have a graph of current versus time, it tends to follow a curve that looks like this. This is what we call an exponential decay curve, 
okay so over time your current will drop in this manner here until it reaches zero when you reach zero your capacity has fully discharged there's no longer any charge flowing from one plate of your capacitor to the other okay now at the same time because you know that your capacitor when it becomes fully charged there's a pd across it so in your case there's a pd of 12 volts across your capacitor when your charge starts to move from one end of your plate to the other end of your plate, the PD across your capacitor here will actually start to decrease with time also. And it will follow an exponential decay curve just like that of your current, okay? And also, if you were to think about the charge that is actually flowing from one plate to the other plate through your circuit here, the charge is also going to be exponentially decreasing because charge and current are very closely related. If you recall what's the definition of current, current is actually defined as rate of flow of charge such that I is proportional to Q. So if your I versus T has this graph shape, it follows that Q versus T must also be having the same graph shape. Okay. So from there, <clears throat> Because it follows an exponential decay curve, you notice that the gradient decreases with time. Hence, the rate at which current, PD, or charge would decreases is actually proportional to the amount of current, PD, or charge that it has left. So what we mean by that is this. If you just look at the IT graph on the left-hand side here, notice how your current decreases with time. Because the gradient is changing with time here, the amount that decreases each time would be different. Okay, so in order to compare the decays of your current PD or charge, you use a particular quantity called time constant, which is a measure of how long it takes for a capacitor to discharge. Now, time constant has this symbol. This symbol here looks like this. This is actually your grid symbol tau. It's called grid symbol tau. Is a Greek symbol, it's called tau. So we use it to represent time constant. Now, time constant in your syllabus is actually defined as the time taken for the charge of a capacitor to decrease to 0 0.37 of its original value. Okay, or you can think of that 0 0.37 is actually 1 over E. If you use your calculator and you divide by E, it's actually 0 0.37. Okay. So this definition that you see here actually has a very similar meaning to something that you have learned in nuclear physics. If you recall in nuclear physics, you had something called half-life. Half-life is the time taken for number of nuclei to decrease to half is original value. That was what you learned in nuclear physics for half-life, isn't it? Time taken for the number of nuclei to decrease to half is original value. So when it comes to discharge of a capacitor, you have a particular quantity that is kind of similar to that. But this one is called time constant. It's the time taken for the charge of your capacitor to decrease to 0 0.37 of its original value or in other words, 1 over E of its original value. This one, you can think of it another way, is the time taken for your charge or your capacitor to decrease to a third of its original value, okay? But if you want to define it in your exam, you have to be specific in terms of the value. It's either 1 over E or 0 0.37, okay? So that one is time constant. So what's so useful about time constant? You can look at the next page here. If you have a graph of charge versus time that decreases exponentially, as I mentioned earlier, how you would view your time constant would be something like this. Your charge decreases like this, okay? When you have one time constant, if you were originally at Q0, it will decrease by about third to 0.37 Q0. This is after one half life. Uh, sorry, after one time constant. If you again go through another time constant, this 0 0.37 will now decrease to 0 0.14 Q0. This one is actually 0 0.37 of the original value. 
or close to a third of the original value. Then after that, if you have another time constant, that 0.14 Q0 will now become 0.05 Q0 because here again, it has actually decreased by roughly a third again. Okay, so this is how you would actually view time constant from a graph. Okay, so a shorter time constant usually tells you that you have a quicker exponential decay because it takes a faster time, a shorter time for your charge to decrease to a third of its original value. Okay, now when you're talking about time constant, there's an equation that is used to relate time constant. So if say you have a capacitor of capacitance C, say this one is your capacitor of capacitance C here, and it's trying to discharge through a resistor of resistance R, this one here, your time constant is actually defined by the product of the resistance as well as your capacitance. Okay, this is what time constant is. All right. And this constant here can be actually used for your exponential decay equations for discharging capacitor so that you can actually determine a few quantities after a certain time t. Now this one, you will notice is quite similar to something that you've learned in nuclear physics again. If you recall in nuclear physics that time, I told you that when your radioactive sample decays, it tends to follow an exponential decay curve like this. And if I tell you that your graph here is a general parameter x versus t, you can say that x is equals to x naught exponential negative lambda t. But if you apply specifically for certain quantities that you've learned, you could say that n equals to n naught exponential negative lambda t, a equals to a naught exponential negative lambda t, and then finally r equals to r naught exponential negative lambda t. Now this group of equations that you've learned here, for nuclear physics, you will see a somewhat similar pattern when it comes to discharging of a capacitor, just that the quantities are slightly different now. So say for example, when you're talking about graph of, sorry, when you're talking about current I, that's discharging for a capacitor at time T, as I mentioned to you, a graph of I versus T would look like this now. If you're interested in finding out the current I, at a particular time t when your capacitor is discharging, your equation will be i equals to i naught exponential negative t over rc. Your rc here is actually your time constant that you have defined above. Okay, and then after that, you know that current is actually directly proportional to pd, and current is also directly proportional to charge. So that equation that you originally have can be modified to become this so that the pd across a capacitor at time t will be vv naught exponential negative t over rc and charge will be qq naught exponential negative t over rc okay so i know i can do this because the graph shapes are essentially the same because if here you're talking about b versus t and q versus t they're all going to be following an exponential decay curve like this. And I know that I is proportional to Q. I is also proportional to V. So I can make this kind of conclusion here. Okay. So you compare with your nuclear physics decay equations. And now you compare with your capacitance discharge equation. You notice that the form is actually quite similar. If you were to refer to the nuclear physics equations, it's always exponential to the raised to the power of negative, and then it's the constant multiplied with t. This one here, you will notice is exponential raised to a negative power, but it's the time divided by some sort of constant. In your case, your constant is actually your time constant. In nuclear physics, your constant is actually your decay constant. Okay, so there's a certain pattern here that you should be able to recognize. Okay, so this one is discharge or capacitor. It's a very short part to your 2022 syllabus, but there are some questions we can do from there. So we'll just start with some of the questions. All right.